Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. The watchword of our day is freedom. Everyone wants to be free. And today, as we look at Jeremiah chapter 5, we'll see that a life of sin is anything but free. I'm Russ Brewer, and you are listening to our daily podcast where we're studying the key chapters of the Bible. Today, we're looking at a heavy chapter that focuses on sin and its cause and its result and even its remedy. So why should we avoid sin? Often when we say we should avoid sin, it's because God's not a part of any moment where we're really just in sinful rebellion against him. And, and God's people want him a part of every moment of their lives. But today, as we turn to Jeremiah chapter 5, we're going to see that the Lord lays out some other very concrete reasons why we should avoid sin. We're going to see that, one, it brings judgment upon us, and two, it cages us like trapped birds. And if we insist upon a path of sin, the Lord will give us over to serve the very sin we thought was so freeing. So today we turn to Jeremiah chapter 5, and as we go to this passage, let's just start out by putting it in its overall context. So far, we've been working through Jeremiah's chapter 1 through 3, and the Lord has been laying out his indictment against the people of Israel. Then in chapter 4, which we have skipped, but just giving you a quick overview, chapter 4 starts out with the Lord's assurances that if they would repent, they would have a central place in God's work in this world. And yet his offer for them to repent was not some kind of superficial show of repentance, but true heart change. And in verse 10, Jeremiah laments over this judgment he has seen, and he gives this vision of widespread devastation that's coming upon the land. And then in verse 30 of chapter 4, the Lord then starts to lay out the reasons for this coming judgment in just greater detail, and those reasons just begin to spill into chapter 5. Back in chapter 4, verse 30, for instance, they dress in provocative clothes and jewelry and makeup. In verse 31, the people are crying out in great pain. They can't understand why, and we see why here in chapter 5. Chapter 5 just continues this case of God's judgment against all of Israel, the whole nation, and their society has become filled with injustice and unrighteousness. So starting in verse 1, the Lord says, If you roam the streets, you would find no one who walks in justice or seeks the truth. In fact, the Lord even says, If you can find just one person, he would pardon the nation. Instead, the Lord only finds people playing spiritual games. And in verse 2, they'll say things like, As the Lord lives! but they're just using that to trick people. They want to seem like they're sincere, devout followers of the Lord, but they have no intention of actually following God or trembling at his word. And this spiritual dullness has infected every level of society, goes on to say, from the weak and the poor in verse 4 to the rich and the powerful in verse 5. No one wants to submit to God. Now, as we go to verse 6, verse 6 starts to show us what their sins will result in. Verse 6 says, Therefore, as in because of the sins we've just laid on out, a lion from the forest will slay them, a wolf of the deserts will destroy them, a leopard is watching their cities, everyone who goes out of them will be torn in pieces because their transgressions are many, their apostasies are numerous. And so this is just showing us here that those who disregard the Lord lose his protective umbrella and they become vulnerable to every kind of threat. Everywhere they go, from the forest to the desert to the cities, they are in danger of being torn to pieces. Why? Well, when we are God's people in fellowship with him, we gather around him as his people and we tremble at his word and we're unified around him. We have his grace and strength working in us and through us. But if we have no fellowship with him, if we are not concerned about him, if we're not walking with him, we'll be fragmented into a million pieces and and any kind of danger can just overtake us. And this is just a principle that if you don't stand for the Lord, you'll fall for anything. And so verse 6 ends saying, their transgressions are many, their apostasies are numerous. Now, transgression is basically just a sin against God. Apostasies is when we embrace false doctrines that take us away from true fellowship with the living Lord. And verse 7 shows us what some of these apostasies were. It says, They have forsaken the Lord and sworn by false gods. Dropping down to verse 12, it says, They have lied about the Lord and said, Not he, misfortune will not come on us. In other words, guys, God wants everything to come up roses. We're going to be just fine. But they did not want to hear the word of God. And so they were going to fall for these sappy messages of hope that weren't true at all. Now, on the one hand, life is tough. And and I can understand wanting to hear a message that's positive, encouraging. But what people really need and what's going to really encourage our hearts is to be filled with the spirit of God. That's what's going to give us the real hope and strength we need to live. And as we've been seeing for the last few days, going back to Isaiah 66 verses 1 and 2, God dwells in the heart that is humble and contrite and trembles at his word. Those qualities are the throne in our heart that God sits upon. 
And if we don't ever speak about sin, if we don't address what's separating us from God, then we'll never have that throne of humility and contrition and fear of God that is required for us to abide in fellowship with him. Sometimes the pains and challenges we go through in life is just to bring us to that place where we are humble before him, where we are contrite before him, where we do tremble at his word. And so the worst thing we can do is try to give people false assurances and false encouragement when they really just need to be repenting and walking with God. We need to give them the truth. But here in this passage, these people don't want the truth. If you look over at verses 21 to 24, later on in the chapter here, uh, they were senseless in verse 21. Uh, They did not fear God in verse 22 or tremble at his presence. In verse 24, they weren't even trying to develop a righteous fear of God. Now, how could this happen? Where were their teachers? Where were the prophets and the priests? Where were the people who were calling them to obedience to the Lord? Well, their teachers were actually making the problem worse by proclaiming a message of peace when there was no peace. I mean, how do you compete with that? Peace, peace, everything's going to be great. God's trying to get their attention here, and these false teachers are just pulling out the wires of these smoke alarms. And so going back to verse 13, the Lord says, The prophets are as wind, and the word is not in them. Uh, what a great visual picture here. Uh, these guys, their messages were, were filled with wind. They blew around, they made lots of noise, they might push the deck chairs around a bit, but their words had no real substance in them. They might even cite the word of God, or as we saw earlier, they might even say, As the Lord lives. But their purpose is so far from God's purpose, and they're so mishandling his word that it has no true, lasting spiritual power to produce real change. Now, you can see this difference between these windbags of verse 13 and Jeremiah's message in verse 14. Verse 14 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, because you, Jeremiah, have spoken this word, behold, I am making my words in your mouth fire, and this people would, and it will consume them. (laughs) Yikes, that's quite a message. Uh, You know, we talk about power in preaching, but I'm not sure people want this kind of power. And Jeremiah's words were going to burn up those who hear them. Fact is, God's message is convicting. It's like a hammer, Jeremiah says. It's like a fire we see here. And if we're not pursuing a holy life, if we're not trusting in the cleansing, covering blood of Christ to cover all of our sins and cleanse us of all of our sins, if we want to hold on to our sin and refuse to follow God, God's word's going to burn, and ultimately, that's a good thing. We should always tremble at God's word, and often it should burn us a little bit because all of us have more areas of our life that can be brought into further submissions to the Lord. And so it's a good thing when God's word is convicting, but where it convicts, he will provide the grace for us to repent and change and conform to what he is teaching. Well, these people don't want to be holy. They don't want this message of Jeremiah. They're looking for happy, encouraging messages. And so down in verse 31, it says, if you look over there, it says, The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule on their own authority, and my people love it so. The people actually preferred false teaching to the truth. It's sometimes said that the modern church would rather be entertained by heresy than bored with the truth. We've got to fight against that temptation. Here in verse 31, the message of these so-called prophets was false. Uh, The work of these religious leaders was based on their own authority. They weren't ordained by God. They weren't called by God. And the people were okay with this. In fact, they wanted it this way. They didn't want the, the rigid rules of God. They wanted to do their own thing. They wanted to make things up for themselves. Well, this indictment against the people continues on in chapter 6. So let's just glance at a few verses in chapter 6 as well. If you look down at chapter 6, verse 14, it says, They, these false teachers, have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, Peace, peace, but there is no peace. You see, the people were truly broken. Remember back in chapter 4, they were wailing and they don't understand why. And they're already seeing the birth pangs of God's judgment upon them. And rather than pointing the people to repent and pursue holiness, the prophets are like, Hey, everybody, God wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise. You're okay. Just follow this little system I've made on up and you'll be happy. And they were just proclaiming this message of false peace that was providing only a superficial healing. It wasn't what the people needed. It's just what they wanted. In fact, if you look back up to verse 10 of chapter 6, the Lord says, Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. Reproach, this idea of just, they just feel like, man, God's word is so condemning. I don't want to hear that. This is how these people receive the word of God. Jeremiah was seeking to give them the true message of God. that's going to give them true peace. But it did require repentance. It did require change. And they didn't want to hear that message. To them, it was a reproach. They just felt condemned by it. They didn't want to change. Like, what, me? I'm, guys, I'm good. Please, I'm just fine. To the unaccustomed ear, the word of God is at times condemning. It even at times sounds backwards. Or even some people might say it's boring or irrelevant for our day. 
And back then, the people were rejecting the word of God. They would rather just have the false, exciting message of their day. And so these false teachers were more than happy to give them this false message. There's something we think about. There's a lot of money to be made in just making people happy. Uh, You may have heard it even said before that if you want something from someone, you give them what they want. If you want to help them, you give them what they need. Jeremiah truly loved the people and sought to give them what they needed, even if it wasn't very popular or very warm and fuzzy. These false prophets, they probably seemed more loving and more sweet and more gentle and more kind, but they were actually fleecing the flock and the people didn't even know it. And so that's some great stuff in chapter 5, but we're not actually done. So let's go back and look at the result of their sin. If we go to this passage here, we see that in verses 15 to 17, the result of this sin is this pending judgment from Babylon. He's going to be bringing this nation from afar. In verse 16, their quiver is like an open grave. In verse 17, they're going to devour the harvest, the food, their children, their, their flocks, their vines, and their cities. And so this message of judgment is familiar. But notice in verse 18, verse 18 says, Yet, even in those days, I will not make you a complete destruction. And so we're seeing here again this reminder that God has a future and a hope for Israel. And so there's even a message of true hope in the midst of this warning here. Uh, If you go on to verse 19, we see this warning. It says, It shall come about when they say, Why has the Lord our God done all these things to us? Then you shall say to them, As you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you will serve strangers in a land that is not yours. And so here we're seeing that when a person rebels against the Lord and seeks to follow something besides him, the Lord will give us over to the very things that we are pursuing and we'll become enslaved to them. This is a critical principle for us to understand. The message of the Bible is that there's really only two masters. There's the Lord and there's sin. Now, sin can master us through our flesh or the world or things like that. But if we do not serve the Lord, we will be serving sin. There's no halfway. And look at sin's power. If you drop down to verses 26 and 27, In verse 26, it says, For wicked men are found among my people. They watch like fowlers, lying in wait. They set a trap. They catch men. Now, this is a fantastic verse and a fantastic principle, but we got to know what a fowler is. What's a fowler? A fowler is a person who hunts birds. And back in that day and age, they would often hunt birds by making traps for them. And, And these traps would capture the birds and they would put those birds into cages. Now, to set those traps, you had to be good at it. You had to be stealthy, ingenious, inconspicuous. And all of the while, you're quietly laying that trap for some unsuspecting bird. And that's what sin is like. And that's what people of this world do when they try to entice people to sin against the Lord. They're laying a trap for them. And verse 27 gives us the result of what that trap will do in our lives. Verse 27 says, Like a cage full of birds, so their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they become great and rich. When their work is complete, they have caged the people. They have caged us. We thought we were free when we left the Lord, but all we've done is naively walked into a trap and now we're caged. It's often said that sin takes you further than you wanted to go, keeps you longer than you wanted to stay, and costs you more than you wanted to pay. And so that's what's going on here. These people who are proclaiming this message of freedom are really entrapping the people. And so the most loving message Jeremiah can give these people was God's warnings about what lies ahead down that path of sin and to warn them, you guys are going to be enslaved, you're going to be trapped, repent and come back to the Lord. Well, so that's chapter five. You can see there's a ton of great stuff in here, especially about the dangers of sin. And its remedy is to fear God and tremble at his word, because when our hearts are humble and contrite and God-fearing, God's grace abides within us, enables us to hear his word, to receive it, and respond according to his message. And so that's why we need to be on guard about who we listen to. Uh, There are so many false teachers in our world today, so many great teachers as well, plenty of great teachers, but plenty of false teachers. We need to fill our ears with a message that guides us into further humility and further contrition and fear of the Lord. This chapter also shows us that sin is like a snare on the leg of a bird. It's been laid out for that bird. And if we don't realize it, when we sin, we're stepping into a trap. When we give ourselves over to sin, it'll capture us and enslave us. And so we need to pursue righteousness. And when we do turn to the Lord, when we do repent, he will deliver us. Well, we'll end our study there. Thanks so much for listening today. Hope you have a great rest of your day. We'll catch you tomorrow. God bless. God bless.